Hey guys, how you doing? It's me. Welcome to the first episode of Human Factors from 10,500 feet. I've been flying along today, having a great time, and I've just been thinking about you guys. You're going to be reading about automation this week in your book, and I've been playing with automation all day long, and I keep thinking about how relevant what I've been doing is to your reading. So I thought I'd just talk to you about it briefly, and hopefully it'll prepare you for the reading and, and maybe help you understand the reading a tad bit more. Uh, I'll do a quick lesson now, and then maybe I, I might be able to do another one uh, on my way to Austin later this week, okay? So um, you're going to learn about a number of principles regarding automation in Chapter 12 this week. And uh, you'll hear over and over throughout uh, that chapter the concept of different levels of automation and different stages of automation. And um, a level of automation is how much computer assistance you receive, how much the machine is helping you in a task. And uh, it can vary on a scale of 1 to 10. Uh, reference the chart in your book and have a look at that. I'll, I'll have you do that a couple times today. And then it also references four different stages of automation. And these uh, mirror the HIP stages, human information processing stages. So uh, you can automate different phases like perception, analysis, decision making, and response execution. And then with each one of those stages, you can have a different level of automation. So today I'd like to talk briefly about my autopilot. It's over here in the bottom left of my aircraft. It's on. I'm not doing anything. I'm just watching, and that's great. Um, I'm actually over Lake Havasu, it looks like, up here soon. And um, I'm on my way to Los Angeles, and I'm not really doing much of anything. I'm just watching for traffic. I'm listening to air traffic control, and I'm monitoring different systems. And um, I'll talk about that in just a little bit. It's called supervisory control. But let's talk about the autopilot. So I've told it what to do. I programmed it. I pushed some buttons. It's talking to my GPS. It's giving me a course and an altitude. I gave that to the autopilot. And, and I've done nothing else. I'm just monitoring. And uh, if we get to a waypoint, like I'm coming up here on, uh, on 29 Palms um, VOR, and then I'm going to hang a right turn, the autopilot's going to do that on its own. It's going to tell me, hey, guess what? I'm getting ready to turn right towards Los Angeles, and I have no say in that. Now, the one say I do have is I can reach down here and turn my autopilot off, or I can push this button right here, and that turns my autopilot off. But other than that, uh, the autopilot's going to do its own thing. So based on that information, I'd like for you to go into the book and look at that those different levels of automation from 1 through 10, and let me know what level does that sound like to you. It should be on the rather relatively higher end of the automation scale, right? Now, in addition to that, like I said, there's different stages of automation. And with the autopilot in mind, um, I'm not doing anything. I'm not pushing buttons. I'm not interacting with it. I'm not perceiving the information. I'm monitoring it. But it is taking in the entire world, the GPS, where we are, where we're going, what we're doing. And it's manipulating the control surfaces out on the wing. It is literally moving the wing control surfaces up and down and flying this airplane on its own. So now go look at those four different stages of automation and try to figure out what stage of automation that is. Now I briefly talked about supervisory control. Um, this is where, uh, this is a state that I'm in right now. The aircraft is automated. I've got an engine monitor that's monitoring everything. I've got some engine gauges that are doing their own thing. I've got maps. I've got GPSs. I've got two different GPS, three different GPSs. I have an autopilot. They're all doing their own thing, and I have very little interaction with the system right now. This is the definition of supervisory control, and as the name implies, I am just supervising. I am just looking for anomalies. I am looking for displays that are outside of the parameters that uh, I'm expecting of them. And so uh, supervisory control is a difficult thing. Uh, humans are not good at this, especially over time. It becomes a vigilance task like we talked about earlier this semester. We are not good at looking and monitoring for an anomaly uh, for extended periods of time. Now, this is a five-hour flight today, um, you know, but relatively speaking, it's not that long compared to, let's say, a B-2 mission, where you're going to depart at a white man Air Force base, and you're going to fly to the Middle East nonstop with a crew of two people and fly back. That is an incredibly difficult vigilance type of a task, and supervisory control for that long of a period of time becomes very, very problematic. So there's something that you'll read about in your book this week called adaptive automation. And adaptive automation um, uses some of the neuroergonomic principles we've discussed, and we'll also talk more about stress and workload later this semester, towards the end of the semester. And we can, we can use a number of different monitoring devices 
to figure out what the operator's current state is. Cognitive state, mental state, arousal, even situation awareness. And we can monitor these things, and we can determine um, if the level of automation is appro for the, appropriate for the particular circumstance. So if I started getting very tired and complacent and missing some cues and getting, uh, um, getting com uh, complacent in that way, then the autopilot can maybe start giving me some tasks back slowly, one by one. Maybe it would just give me altitude hold at first. Maybe now I've got to control the altitude. Whoa! Okay? And if I'm just controlling the altitude for a little bit, now I have to get more involved in the situation. I'm getting more engaged, and that's going to give me um, that more optimum level of arousal, referencing the yerkes dodson curve that we talked about earlier this semester, and we'll talk later this semester about uh, that curve as well. So the automation comes and it goes. Also, if I get very, very stressed, if I'm on an instrument approach and I'm hand flying and I can't see anything and I, ATC's talking to me and there's buzzers going off and warnings going off and I'm just getting overwhelmed with the stress and the workload that's being placed on me, the automation can detect that using sensors and it can start taking some of those processes back from me. Maybe it engages the autopilot. Maybe it starts in an advanced form in, many, in a few years from now. Maybe it starts communicating to air traffic control for me. Um, those types of things um, are examples of adaptive automation. This, this adaptive control of, this, in this case, the aircraft back and forth between the machine, the airplane, and the operator, myself. And um, it's interesting that uh, there's been a lot of research that has shown the efficacy of adaptive automation and how it is ideal for maintaining arousal and maintaining performance, and in some cases possibly maintaining situation awareness. But we, we, we have not seen it implemented much yet. Um, we have the monitoring uh, devices, uh, but we don't, uh, and we have the, certainly the computer ability to take that control back and forth between the operator, but we don't see a lot of examples of it implemented. I hope we do in the near future. Um, so. Um, I did forget about one thing. I did talk about a high level of automation with the autopilot. I forgot that I did do an audio capture for you. I just departed out of a place called Cottonwood, Arizona. They had cheap fuel. It was actually pretty. It was next to uh, Sedona, Arizona. I departed out of there about an hour ago, and um, there was a very large mountain to the west of the airport, 8,000 feet. And so uh, I captured some audio for you, <laughs> only for my students. Um, of flying towards that mountain and capturing the uh, traffic alert collision system. Um, uh, and, uh, and I have that audio cue for you now. Terrain ahead. Pull up. Terrain. Terrain. Pull up. Pull up. So hopefully you could hear that. That's my uh, traffic warning system on the GPS. And uh, that warning system was telling me, hey, you're going to hit this mountain if you keep flying towards it. It's advising me. It's not making any actions. It's not taking control of the airplane. It's simply, it's not even really telling me what to do. It's not even telling me turn left, turn. I guess it is telling me to pull up, but it's really just telling me there's a mountain up ahead, and if you keep flying at this course, you're going to hit it. And so um, that's uh, a relatively low level of automation. Based on the information I just provided, I'd like for you to go reference that same table. Table uh, with levels of automation, 1 through 10, and tell me what level would that be. I think that would be a very useful skill to have. And then go look at the four different stages of, uh, of automation and tell me what stage would that be. And notice in this case, it's not manipulating the controls of the airplane. So what is it doing? Which one of those four stages? That would be a really good activity. So uh, I think that's what we'll cover for now. There's a few other things that automation is so exciting. It's everywhere, especially in aviation. And so uh, if I get some time, maybe we'll do this again on my way from Los Angeles to Austin. And uh, I'll post it on our SharePoint site, and I hope you enjoy it. And that's another episode of Human Factors from 10,500 feet. Take care, guys. We'll see you. Bye.